Hello everybody, my name is Jeff Janess, and today we're going to talk about basic GIS concepts. So what is GIS in general? What tools do you use to do it? As far as tools go, in this class we're going to focus on ArcGIS Pro in particular, which is one of the main GIS packages out there. But I'll also mention a few good and much cheaper alternatives if you ever want to try them out. Now what is GIS? Well, first of all, it has a lot to do with maps. We all know that paper maps are great. They show where things are, they often let us estimate simple things like size and distances. In forestry, we know better than most how important a good map can be, and I assume most of you are familiar with topo maps. If you're into forestry, ecosystem research, or environmental management, you've probably seen these. And if so, then, then you know you can estimate distances based on these section lines, for example. If you know a section is roughly one square mile, then you have a quick way of matching this map to the landscape around you. Topo maps are especially good at estimating elevation. You just look at contour lines near the area you're interested in and you'll have the elevation. If there's any drawback to these paper maps is that the map only shows what the author wants to show. We really don't have a lot of flexibility in what we get. We can see what somebody else decided to show us, but not necessarily what we personally are most interested in seeing. So, for example, this topo map doesn't show our project area unless we draw it in manually. Now, GIS goes much further than a paper map. You can adjust the map to more precisely fit your needs. So, for example, the Wall of Fire back in 2011 was a massive fire in eastern Arizona. Maybe I want to map the burn severity across the extent of the Wall of Fire, and I don't want to be distracted by extraneous lines like section lines or topo lines. Maybe I want a second map where I can see where the wallow is on the larger landscape. And on this second map, maybe I just want the wallow boundary and a couple of state boundaries. Now I can design this final map to be exactly what I want, and GIS lets us do this. Now here's another example. The Museum in Northern Arizona has this magazine called Plateau. It comes out periodically. Here we wanted to show the Greater Flagstaff area and where it's set within the Rio de Flag watershed. We only want to show particular things like the shape of the landscape, maybe some major drainages and streams, and a few important locations on the landscape that are mentioned in the magazine. So GIS lets us create this thing exactly the way we want. Now, it's great to be able to design your own maps, and it's even a lot of fun, but truly this is the least powerful thing you can do with a good GIS. GIS goes much further, and one of the best things about it is that most GIS data have attributes associated with them. You can not only see where things are, but you can get extensive information about what they are. In fact, this is where we get the name Geographic Information Systems, which is what GIS stands for. We can get information about individual features in your map, we can identify areas that meet some some complex set of criteria, we can generate new data that describe the areas that we care about. And it really gets fun when you start trying to find places based on complex sets of criteria. This example shows a region around Lake Tanganyika in Central Africa. This is part of a project I did with the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations a few years back. We wanted to provide tools to developing countries that would let them analyze the landscape in interesting and useful ways. So, for example, if we wanted to build a factory in this drainage system, well, we might be concerned about the effects of a toxic spill into the watershed. In this case, we'd want to be able to find out what areas are downstream from that factory. Alternatively, we might detect some pollution on the watershed, and in this case, we want to know what is upstream of that area to look for the source of that pollution. This ability to identify regions based on flow direction is something GIS really shines at. We can also do a more complex analysis. Suppose we build a fish hatchery at this spot. If we have a spill or escape out of that fish hatchery, then the fish could all swim downstream through this red area, but at any point they can also turn around and swim upstream into any of the side drainages. Therefore, we need some easy way to identify this entire larger watershed region. And GIS is ideal for this kind of problem. Another example. Sometimes we want to select areas based on some complex set of criteria. Here we have a port off the coast of Morocco in northern Africa, and we want to identify where people can do commercial fishing. In this project, there were three constraints that mattered. First, there's a legislative constraint, which people couldn't fish within six kilometers of the port. It's just the local law. Second, there's a fuel and time constraint for the boats. They can't fish further than 20 kilometers out and still make a decent living. And finally, there was an equipment constraint where they couldn't fish in areas deeper than 200 meters. So based on these three criteria, we quickly identify these areas here as the potential fishing zones. These kind of complex multi-criteria constraints are pretty common. We're going to cover how to do this type of selection later on in the class. 
but for now just consider them as previews of coming attractions. And of course you can go further than just selecting data in GIS. You can actually create new data sets that classify the landscape into different criteria. So here's an example called the Recreation Opportunity Spectrum, where we classify a national forest into areas that offer different recreational options for visitors. Some people like to recreate close to developed facilities. Other people like to experience pristine areas far from civilization. This Recreation Opportunity Spectrum helps us steer the visitors to the right places. Another common example of finding areas by complex criteria is finding the shortest route between locations. Personally, I'm very interested in the shortest route from the NAU School of Forestry to the Beaver Street Brewery, and identifying these shortest routes actually requires a fairly sophisticated GIS analysis. It's pretty exciting that so many sources give it to you for free these days. For example, both Google Maps and Apple Maps are happy to show me my shortest route to get my Beaver Street Burger, and ArcGIS can do this as well. These web and cloud-based tools like Google and Apple Maps are really simple GIS systems and actually much easier to use for finding shortest routes than ArcGIS. ArcGIS will do much, much more than these simple web tools, but it's really not nearly as intuitive. And if you have a GPS that tells you the best route to take you to some location, then your GPS is actually performing a GIS function inside. Now, it gets fun when you start using GIS to analyze complicated spatial relationships. Any question that depends on location is potentially a GIS question. In this example, we're worried about wave energy that hits at some location, and specifically we're trying to figure out how wave energy affects coral reefs. The energy from a wave is a function of wind speed plus the distance the wind is blowing over open water. The lines here on this map represent the observed wind direction, so GIS question is to calculate what we call the fetch distance, which is the distance that the wind is allowed to blow over open water. The longer the fetch distance, the more energy that wave contains and the greater effect it might have on the coral reefs. Now, Another interesting part of this analysis was that we wanted to treat very small reefs as if they wouldn't block wave energy. If the reef was very small, then we just assumed that it wouldn't block wave energy because the waves would just flow around it and merge on the other side. In these cases, we just pretend the reef wasn't there. But the trick here was that, in this case, size is defined not by acres or hectares, but rather by the visible arc of the reef on the horizon. It's not the actual size in acres, but just how much of that horizon the reef covers from your perspective. Smaller reefs have a larger arc if they're closer to you. And this means that, in this case, reef A actually was considered to block the wind and wave action because it covered greater than 5 degrees of the horizon when viewed from the coral reef. Reef B, on the other hand, even though it's larger in acreage, has a smaller arc on the horizon and therefore we did not use it to stop the wind and wave action at this reef. And of course, GIS is also good for analyzing the shape of the landscape. We can identify hills and valleys, we calculate slopes and aspects, lots of different ways to calculate and estimate the ruggedness of the landscape. Then there's the curvature, which tells you how water behaves as it flows over a point. For example, water might accelerate or decelerate as it flows over the landscape, or it might diverge as, it's, as if it's flowing down a ridgeline, or it might converge as if it's in the bottom of a drainage. Curvature is also good for estimating how protected or exposed the location is. Curvature can tell us a lot of interesting things about the landscape. Now you can classify the landscape in a variety of different ways, and in this example we're classifying by what we call slope position using something called the topographic position index, or TPI. For this analysis, we first calculate the slope from a data set of elevation values. We can then use that slope plus the elevations in combination to define ridge tops and valley bottoms. Even better, we can make this sensitive to scale. If we calculate TPI at multiple scales and combine them, this lets us find, for example, a small ridge top down at the bottom of a valley, or distinguish between upland and lowland drainages. TPI lets us analyze the way different phenomena might perceive the landscape. For example, a cougar probably sees the landscape differently than a mouse does. What is a hill to a cougar may not be a hill to a mouse, and vice versa. And you can analyze the landscape accordingly for these different animals. We can generate statistical surfaces that describe the landscape. 
In this particular example is what we call a Mahalanobis distance. It defines the landscape in terms of how similar any point on the landscape is to some ideal combination of landscape variables. And in this example, we had a bunch of spotted owl locations. And at each spotted owl location, we measure the slope and the elevation. Then, based on those two variables, we can classify the entire landscape and based on its similarity to slope and elevation to what the owls seem to have selected. This kind of analysis is useful for identifying potential areas where the animal might be found, might help you plan future survey efforts. It can also help you identify what parts of the landscape are most important to threaten and endangered species, so you can protect those areas as part of your conservation efforts. Here's another example of a statistical surface used in wildlife analysis. And this is what in GIS we call a kernel density, but in the regular world we usually call a heat map. This type of analysis lets us identify areas where an animal seems to spend most of its time. Here's another example of a kernel density surface used with bald eagle locations. We had some bald eagles with radios on them, and based on observations over time, we're able to see that these are the areas that the eagles seem to spend most of their time. And then, based on these same bald eagle locations, we can see if there's any kind of bald eagle preference in terms of aspect of the landscape. When eagles roost, do they care about what direction the landscape is facing? This particular example was sort of interesting because bald eagles in Arizona are usually here during the winter, much more than the summer. So these locations are mostly winter locations. And if you look at this chart, this is what we call a polar plot or a rose plot, similar to a typical histogram, but it's, it's a histogram bent around in a circle. So if you look at the plot on the left, you can see that this is the direction the landscape was facing where the eagle roosted each night. You can see they roosted most often at roughly 33 to 34 degrees aspect, meaning the landscape was generally facing sort of northeasterly most of the time when the eagles were roosting. Now the plot on the right shows the daytime activity. This is times when they could be flying or be perched or just generally foraging somewhere. There didn't seem to be any particular trend in the direction that the landscape was facing at eagle locations in the daytime. It seemed to be facing in all directions pretty uniformly. But it was this nighttime where they seemed to be really focused in the northeast. And one especially interesting thing about this is that since they're winter residents here and they're roosting at night, and at night they tend to be on northeast facing slopes, then basically they're selecting the coldest part of the landscape at the coldest time of day during the coldest time of year. It really does get pretty cold here in the winter. So they seem to be choosing really cool areas at night. Now, this might not have anything to do with local temperature. Maybe they prefer cool weather when they're roosting, or maybe it's just the habitat type. There are different forest vegetation cover types on the north-facing slope, so maybe they're just selecting the forest type. It's hard to say. Often you can spot patterns like this on the landscape, and then you can make a career out of trying to figure them out. You can also do something called least cost path analysis. Here's an example where we're trying to connect fragmented habitat patches. We have some area up here and down here that are protected areas that are unlikely to be developed. And these are actually national forests down in southern Arizona. This entire region through the middle is almost certainly going to be developed. And in this example, the urban planners wanted to avoid further fragmentation of local wildlife populations. So they wanted to preserve portions of the region to allow for animal movement between the two protected areas. Well, we can use this least cost path analysis to identify the biologically best habitat to protect. And we do this a lot when we're trying to find biologically best areas for a species. Honestly, it's common that the biologically best landscape also turns out to be the most profitable place to develop, so there isn't really an, an option to preserve it. So more often we'll use this biological optimum area here as a baseline to compare to other alternatives. So the developer says maybe we can protect this area up here. Well, we can then check to see how this alternative compares with the biological optimum. We might find that it does almost as well, and so that, that works just fine. We can even use this type of analysis to determine whether the biological optimum itself is even useful. Sometimes just because it's the best place to connect may still not be good enough for the animal to use. So that's just a quick discussion of just a few of the cool things you can do with GIS. And we're going to explore many, many more things over the course of this class. And uh, also, I just want to clarify real quick that GPS is not GIS. A lot of people get them confused, but they're really not the same. GPS stands for Global Positioning System. It's a tool that tells you where you are. Therefore, GPS is a tool that allows you to collect data. 
then GIS is the way you map and analyze that data. GPS is sort of a tool for collection, and GIS is the tool for analysis and mapping. Now, sometimes your GPS receiver will have some basic GIS functions inside it. So if your GPS will calculate the shortest distance from one point to another, well, it's actually doing a GIS function based on its own GPS coordinates. But truly, GIS is a separate thing than GPS. Anyway, that's some highlights of GIS. I think you're going to have a lot of fun once you start learning more about it. Tools are pretty interesting. They do some amazing things. And in the next video, I'll introduce you to ArcGIS Pro. It's an Esri software package. It's one of the major GIS software packages available to you. And I'll also briefly show you a few alternatives you can try if you want. Anyway, thanks so much, everybody. Mm -hmm.